Hello, and welcome to another bonus episode of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Of course, I am your host, Rick Doherty. On today's show, Sarah Says will be here to continue our conversation about my visit to Ireland back in June. The purpose of my trip was to walk Ireland's National Famine Way to raise money and awareness in the fight against domestic violence, but I also did some sightseeing and met some wonderful people. If you want more information about my hike, you can catch my vlog series on the Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty YouTube channel. As a matter of fact, please subscribe to the YouTube channel to be kept up to date. Here, as well as in the other bonus episodes Sarah and I aired on August 14th, we're focusing on what I did away from the trail. That being said, I would still love for all of you to donate whatever amount is possible for you to Casa of Pinellas County, Florida, in honor of my pilgrimage on Ireland's National Famine Way. Casa has been around for decades in the St. Petersburg area of Florida, helping survivors of domestic violence. As I've mentioned before, I grew up in an abusive household with an abusive father. I distinctly remember trying to give myself the motivation to endure that abuse before I would eventually grow up and dedicate my life to fighting for those who were in the same situation. To be honest, when I was in that situation, podcasts weren't even a thing. So I guess I always thought I would speak out against abuse as maybe a professional baseball player or something. But Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty has given me a decent platform and I refuse to waste it. We're asking for $20 today at casapinellas.org slash walkwithrick slash That's C-A-S-A-P-I-N-E-L-L-A-S dot org slash walkwithrick slash. There are no processing fees or middlemen, so every dollar goes directly to CASA. That was very important to me from the start. Because CASA isn't sharing the money with anyone, and since there are a lot of economic stressors right now, and we understand that, we don't want to exclude people who can't afford $20. If you could donate $15, $10, or even $5, you will be helping actual women and children who are escaping abuse. If you've already donated or you need a free way to help, please like and subscribe. That really will help. Now let's welcome back Sarah Says, who had just heard a story about some lovely people I met on a train ride from Dublin to Cork. Sarah, take it away with any more questions you would like to ask me about the trip. So what, other than the train ride, would you say is one of your absolute favorite things that you saw while you were on your journey, whether it was before or after or during, what was one of your favorite things that you really enjoyed? So anybody who followed what I was doing on Twitter or anybody who has my Facebook page or anything like that will know that I spent a lot of time trying to catch places that had to do with Michael Collins, the Irish revolutionary, just definitely like one of those historical heroes of mine. And I set out to find things like his birthplace. There's a museum in a home he had in the town of Clonakilty. Those were things I set out to see. But actually, while I was walking through Dublin on the second day I was there, I was just walking the streets trying to see these different things. And between the James Joyce Museum and the Abbey Theater, there was a pub. On the side of the road. I know. Surprise. There was a pub in (laughs) Dublin. Surprise. (laughs) And they had this sandwich board sign. And I'm like, oh, I'll read this sandwich board sign. So during the Irish Revolution, even though it was Catholics fighting for independence, the Catholic Church officially more supported a home rule. Kind of like what Canada has where they still have the queen on their (laughs) money and stuff, but they get to make their own laws. So the Catholic Church officially wanted that autonomy, but didn't necessarily support irrevocable independence that resulted in a republic. And they didn't support some of the more violent aspects of trying to fight for independence. So Michael Collins and some of his men were excommunicated officially from the Catholic Church. So there was this pub 
that was a few doors down from a huge church. And the priests from that church who sympathized with the revolutionaries would still go to this bar and perform the sacraments for the excommunicated members of the Irish military. And the bar still is in operation. (laughs) And so I went, I had a non-alcoholic Guinness at this bar that was just this really cool, like I wasn't looking for it. It wasn't something I was just walking down the street and I found this really, really cool piece of history that unfortunately they only have size XL t-shirts. So I got a hat for myself and I got my friend Matt a t-shirt because he's a little thinner than me. So that was just one of those things that I had no idea I was going to find it. I really found that on the trail, on Ireland's National Famine Way, which originally, most of you know this, but I'll just give a very, very quick story, and you can find it out by watching the vlogs on Mondays. I was originally going to do the Ireland Way, but for a number of different reasons, I had to change to a different trail, and I switched to Ireland's National Famine Way. Basically, I went from going south to north to going west to east. So I still got to go across Ireland. On the National Famine Way, I went through so many of these little small towns and got to walk into just tiny churches in the middle of nowhere. I stayed at a bed and breakfast on top of a pub on a Saturday night. Oh, and gosh. there were they were blaring <laughs> dance music and people were partying. And I was like, where do these people live? Like... How are there people here? This pub is in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) But I guess if there's, you know, 200 farms scattered throughout hills around this town, there must be enough people that they'll travel in on a Saturday night to dance to Robin Thicke music for some reason. (laughs) And seeing a lot of places like that is interesting. I never would have been there. If it wasn't for the trail, I never would have gone to that little town and seeing those little bits of real Ireland. The National Famine Way goes along a canal. It's also the Royal Canal Way for a certain stretch. Like the two trails are the same thing for a while. And the canal has locks. So the water will kind of drop down at certain points. It's how they keep the water going all the way and they keep control of it. Mm -hmm. Lock 26, there were like 45 of them. So that was part of how I counted down my way to the end of the trail was as the locks would get lower. But at lock 26, this guy just set up a cafe in his backyard and he sold sodas. He sold coffee. He sold like energy bars and things like that. I walked into his backyard at this cafe And there were two people who were having an argument about Conor McGregor's height. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) And I thought, this is the most Irish thing anybody has ever experienced in the history of time. There are two men yelling at each other over how tall is Conor McGregor. That's pretty (laughs) Irish right there. So, um, that's. Yeah, there were some little things like that along the trail that I just never expected to see. Uh, There's the town of Mullingar, which is basically like a big town or a small city. And they had a statue to pilgrims. And I got to see that. And while I was making this pilgrimage to see this statue dedicated to pilgrims, I didn't know enough people do it that they would have that kind of interest in you know, honoring us with a statue, but it was really cool to see that and walk through this town. So there's like two funny stories from Mullingar. One was I wanted to be dropped off by the taxi. The taxi took me to my hotel the night before, which was, by the way, a gorgeous hotel, and then picked me up the next morning and took me into downtown Mullingar. And I wanted to be dropped off at the church. He was about to drop me off at the cathedral in the middle of Mullingar. And he's like, 
Unfortunately, there's a funeral today at the cathedral. So there's all this traffic and he's like swearing at people in traffic. And he's like, you know, get out of my you know, way and blah, 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 blah. And then he comes around the corner and sees the cathedral and blesses himself. And it was oh. so funny. It was just one of those <laughs> things as this guy is swearing up a storm and then turns the corner and blesses himself. It was very Irish as well. And as I was walking downtown, there was just this older lady who just started walking next to me and just asking me about my trip and talking about the places that I had been. And eventually I even had to be like, you know, I'm sorry. Like, I really appreciate talking to you, but I got to get going here. And that doesn't happen in the States. You don't have somebody just walk up to you on the street and just start talking about you and having an interest in your life. So that was one of those things that was uh, really cool for me. That's really awesome. And like talking about that, how you talked about the pilgrims and they had the statue and these people coming to speak to you about like your trip. Did you run into any other pilgrims while you were on either of these trails? So on the first trail I did, the Ireland way attracts a lot of people like myself who come from all over the world. And there are a lot of different reasons why right now it's not the best time to travel it. And we didn't know that because you can't pick that up in a guidebook. The guidebooks weren't written since the pandemic. But I met a gentleman from the United States. He's from New Orleans. His name's Barter. Oh, nice. That's not his actual name. It's his trail name is Barter because he's really good at talking people into giving him things. I think that's why, <laughs> <laughs> why he got that name. But I met him at the bus station in Cork. And okay. the first couple days when I was still doing the Ireland way before I had to change courses, he was hiking with me and he was just okay. a really nice guy. And I met some people who didn't hike with me on the National Famine Way, but like I said, did stop me and have conversations. There was a woman, I was wearing my shirt that said, you know, Rick Doherty walks across Ireland for mm -hmm. domestic violence victims as I was walking and this old lady pointed at me and said, are you a Doherty? And I'm like, yeah, my family are Doherty's. She says, so you're Irish. I'm from the United States. You know, I have Irish heritage, but I'm not Irish. And she goes, if you come from Doherty's, you're Irish. First of all, <laughs> anybody who listens to this show knows that Doherty is not spelled as it is pronounced. So just no. the fact that she knew how to properly pronounce it, just shows how like when I'm here, nobody knows how to pronounce it, but there it was so common. It was just a cool experience. One of those people that I meet that I don't even know her name, but for the rest of my life, I'll remember how she made me feel welcome. And it wasn't one of those things like, you know, Bono from rattle and hum saying that Irish Americans are fake or whatever. She made me feel like I was a part of this place because my ancestors were from this place. When I was in Limerick, a town that's really cool actually as well, I was taking the train to Limerick and I just started talking to this guy named Alan. And he had taken the train to Cork to take pictures because he's just a photographer and sometimes he just heads to places he wants to photograph. And we were talking on the train and he asked if I knew where the hotel was located. And I'm like, well, I can, you know, Google it and I'll I'll find how to go. And he's like, no, I want to walk you. I want to show you my town. And he just had this ah. intense pride in his town. And I loved that. Just some of those experiences that were just really, really cool. That's really amazing. That would be such a cool experience. So I've been thinking about this and I asked you about it before you left. Now I'm going to ask you about it again, but a little different is you're vegetarian. Try and lean towards vegan. You talked about in Dublin, it was really easy for you to find food. <laughs> As you were in these little towns going across Ireland on the famine way, how did you eat? Like, how did you <laughs> like, did people look at you like you were absolutely bizarre for not eating meat and looking for these options or because I know at one point you, I don't know if your mom had told me or you we're able to find like a potato salad sandwich or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> which I was like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> but like in these small towns, like how did you, how did you approach this? It's kind of the same thing about, you know, 
not drinking. I mean, I thought it was amazing when I saw that you post that Guinness. At first, I had a moment where I was like, what is happening here? And then I saw it was the 0%. And I called my dad. I'm like, guess what, dad? Because my dad doesn't drink either. I'm like, they have Guinness that's 0%. So did they like having that? I was not going to lie. I was a little surprised in certain places, like when you post it, that they had that. Um, but did you get any kind of weird reactions from people? And what did you eat? <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to say is I do sometimes try to do completely plant-based versions of things for two reasons. One, even though I do have dairy products, I know that things like gelatin aren't always considered vegetarian. So if I get something vegan, I know it's not going to have gelatin in it. Right. So I will err on the side of plant-based, but I still do have dairy products. And the first thing I'm going to say is Ireland's dairy is so good. I drink almond milk in the United States. I don't get regular milk. In Ireland, if you drink regular milk ever, drink regular milk when you're there. If you're lactose intolerant, take your medication, plan out (laughs) the bathroom time you need because their dairy is so good. I had milk, I had cheese that was just indescribable how much better it was than the dairy products I would have in the United States. Unbelievable difference. I also think it's funny that of all these incredible things that I saw over in Ireland, the one thing my mother told you about was the potato salad (laughs) sandwich. (laughs) I think that was the most jealous she was of the entire trip, to be honest. <laughs> so I did I have heard of anything like that. <laughs> so I did have some trouble specifically when I was on the trail. I would stop at these pubs and every food option was something with meat. The first night I stopped was fine because it was in a little town and I was able to get a pizza and I got a veggie burger And that was fine. But the second night, this was actually the bed and breakfast that was above the Robin Thicke pub. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They had a restaurant there as well. And the only things I could get were fried brie and a strawberry cheesecake. Now, listen, I'm not going to complain about fried brie and a strawberry cheesecake. (laughs) When that's your (laughs) healthy option, I'm fine. But... (laughs) That was my dinner on Saturday night. And then on Sunday night, I stopped at a pub and the only food I was able to get were fried mushrooms. So that was two nights worth of food for me. Wow. So by the time I got to like Mullingar, I was so hungry that I was like stopping at Subway. I was getting food like everywhere just because, well, I know Subway is going to have a vegetarian option for me. And it might not be the best food I'm going to have here, but I know I can stop. It'll be quick and I can get something substantial that will keep me going as I burn a lot of calories every day. (laughs) Did you get a weird reaction at all, though, from like the pub owners or like the pub people that um, when you went to order, like, did you ask them like, hey, is there a way to get this vegetarian or and they just kind of were like, no. <laughs> or did you just not even bother and say, hey, I'll just get these because I know they're vegetarian? More the latter. But yes, it was sort of hard to explain to some people. When I was going to Castletown Bear, which was the town at the beginning of the Ireland way, and the cab driver was saying, you have to get the fish. Like, this is a fishing village. You have to get it. And I'm like, oh, sorry, I don't. I'm a vegetarian. And, of course, you know, this is the Republic of Ireland. 90% of people are Catholic, so they assume that fish is vegetarian anyway because they're allowed (laughs) to have it on Fridays during Lent. But I'm like, no, I can't have it. And I did get some funny looks. In a lot of those smaller towns, people aren't used to having a lot of vegetarians and a lot of vegans. And it is a big farming country. So they do do a lot of fishing. There were cows everywhere. There were sheep (laughs) everywhere. So this is how they feed people. As a matter of fact, on the National Famine Way, because you were going along the canal, there were just people fishing in the canal the whole way. 
There were people in downtown Dublin who were fishing in this canal and taking the fish home and cooking them. Like, that was how people spent their days. When it was a Saturday or a Sunday, it was just lined with people fishing as I was walking past them. So it's definitely a huge part of their culture, and they did think it was weird. That's fair. When I was in France, we stayed in a small fishing town, and the people I were with, the two of them were vegetarians. And when they were like, oh, and fish and fish, and they're like, oh, we just need this. And the people at the restaurants went to were just like, I'm sorry, what? Like, you don't eat fish? It's like in my big fat Greek <laughs> wedding. We're like, you eat no meat? <laughs> I'll make you lamb. <laughs> Bunt. Oh, I was going to say, my last question that I really, really, it's my burning question, probably my, my most important question that I'm going to ask you today is, how many sheep do you think you saw? <laughs> I, I swear saw all I the them. sheep. I saw all of the sheep. Um, <laughs> at the beginning on the Ireland Way, we were literally walking through, I don't know if you'd call them sheep farms or... We were walking through the mountains, and the mountains are a good place to have sheep because they're growing the wool, so they want them somewhere cold. And it was June, and I was freezing. So the mountains were overlooking the water, so the breeze would come off the water and then go up the mountains. And the colder they make these sheep, the more wool they will grow. Okay. So the trail went through these farms that were raising sheep. So the whole way it was just sheep sitting in the middle of the road, walking around them. Barter would clap together his hiking poles to try to scare them. I just walked by them. I'm like, what are they, what are they going to do? I don't, you know, um, sheep can be I'm sure they can be mean. you. They're looking at you like you need a sweater. I did need a sweater. That is true. <laughs> But yeah, I did see a ton of sheep. And just a couple things that I'll say before we get off here. After I finished, I finished in downtown Dublin. That was where the National Famine Way ends. And then I wanted to hit a couple other places. So I took public transportation to downtown Dublin the day after I finished because I wanted to get my certificate. And I got my certificate of completion but as I was dropped off in downtown Dublin, it just happened to be the day of Dublin's Pride Parade. And I oh got gosh. dropped off right in the middle of the Pride Parade. They would literally stop the parade periodically to let the cars go by. Okay. And that's where I got dropped off to get my certificate. And it was crazy. The atmosphere was outstanding people were having so much fun and it was cool because i got dropped off right by the gpo which is an important place in the irish war for independence or the irish revolution so it had this significance of here's where these people fought for their freedom and then you had people walking down the street celebrating their freedom and it was just a really, really cool vibe. Then I headed up to Derry in Northern Ireland, which was a completely different vibe vis-a-vis -vis freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so Derry is in Northern Ireland, and I don't know how much of the history a lot of our listeners know, but this is where a lot of the troubles happened. Derry is in, quote unquote, Protestant Northern Ireland, you know, part of the United Kingdom. Cities like Belfast are majority Protestant. But Derry is in Northern Ireland, but vastly, overwhelmingly majority Catholic. So it has had a lot of issues. And while there was the Good Friday Accord in the late 90s, and it is a peaceful city now, the remnants are still there and going to see these things. The fact that they have tours where you can go see where a bunch of people died on bloody Sunday in the late sixties. And like, it's just so surreal. Somebody walked me around the town and was talking about his town and just talking about, well, this is where this, and if you look over here, here are signs with Protestants saying how much they hate Catholics. And over here, here's, you know, 
a painting of IRA members. And it was a really, really weird place to see and to think about how recent this history is in terms of these people trying to live together. And they still aren't. A funny thing about that, like if there are funny side notes, it was in late June and every Catholic church had signs for a big 4th of July celebration. It was almost like the Catholic churches were teasing that time that England got their butt kicked by the United States. <laughs> I I couldn't figure out why they were doing it. And then I understood. I'm like, oh, that's funny. They're kind of mocking people in a yeah. fun way, in a taunting way that's kind that's of like funny. sports. But it was a surreal city to experience and to just walk around it. And then I went back down to West Cork to see some of the Michael Collins stuff, his birthplace, where he lived. I got to visit that town and actually spend time not being a hiker, not being a pilgrim and sightseeing. And that was really cool, too. And then I ended things up back in Dublin the night before my birthday I stayed at a bed and breakfast called The Ferryman, which was right over a very, very popular bar, but outlooking the River Liffey. So I was able to just open the window in my bed and breakfast, kick up my feet. I watched YouTube videos while staring at the River Liffey and drinking Coke Zeros. It was the best birthday ever. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then at midnight, I went down to the pub and I had a non-alcoholic beer. They didn't have non-alcoholic Guinness. I don't remember exactly what I had, but I had a beer cool. <laughs> at midnight on my birthday. And it was just this awesome way to finish it. It is something I am never going to forget. I'm about to move, and I know that we're printing out a whole bunch of pictures so I can just have them all over the walls in my new office. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me, Sarah, because I really wanted to talk about it, and we want to continue to promote the fundraiser. So just having you let me rant a little bit, it really was important. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing it. Because like we said at the beginning, you know, we didn't really talk about it when you get got back in detail because we were waiting for this moment. And then, of course, I was expecting you to be back a little later. So I just booked out my month of July. So now we're finally getting to do this. And so it's been, it's been awesome to hear, you know, as someone who's also from Irish ancestry to like hear about all the cool things that you did and experienced and the funny things and the kind of sad things and all of that. So thank you for sharing everything with with me and all everybody else that's listening as well. There was a day where I was trying to see if Sarah could set up a recording and we're texting back and forth to trying to find a day. And at one point she just texts me back, you know, I thought we were done until mid August. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I just don't have time. I literally booked my entire July thinking he'd be gone all of July. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sarah. Work. Thank you. <laughs> There's so much going on at Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty right now. On Thursday, Marissa from Chicago and I will have the second part in our conversation about different ways Walt Disney World could incorporate Star Wars into the parks. We can't get enough Star Wars, and Disney is getting more and more competition from Universal Orlando Resort. Also in Thursday's episode, Sarah Says is going to give us a preview of the big D23 Expo taking place in Anaheim from September 9th to the 11th. On September 15th, Marissa and I will dissect some of the announcements to come out of D23, and we'll talk about the future of Disney theme parks with that new information. In addition, I'm working a lot on video editing so I can bring you vlogs from Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party, Walt Disney World, Universal Orlando Resort, and other parts of Florida that aren't just confined to theme parks. We're going to continue to grow the Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty podcast, YouTube channel, and community. Finally, to donate to CASA of Pinellas County, Florida in honor of my pilgrimage and to help survivors of domestic violence, go to casapinellas.org slash walkwithrick slash that's C-A-S-A-P-I-N-E-L-L-A-S dot org slash walkwithrick slash. 
This episode is going live on August 28th, the day before my mother's birthday. She survived two abusive marriages, and she would love nothing more than for you to donate a few dollars to CASA as a present to her. There will be a new vlog in the Ireland series tomorrow and a new episode of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty on Thursday. Until then, have a great week.